Hi, everybody. This is Melissa Hood, and welcome to Tame Your Brain O. Thanks for joining me again for another prophetic word for the week. We're getting ready to take off, so stay around. If you take off, then uh, we'll see what God's saying. Hope everybody's had a great week. Got a little bit of seal going. Let's see here. I hope you're doing well. Happy Wednesday. I think that I have I've had probably uh, <clears throat> a pretty exciting week considering what's been going on in my life. So my dissertation made it to the or is making it right now. It hasn't made it yet into the IRB, which when it gets IRB approval, which means I can move forward. So I'm almost done. I'll be back on every week after that and uh, hopefully giving you some really, really great insight. Um, before we start, I always want to start off uh, with God. And let it be of him instead of of me. So let's pray and let's get going. So Lord God, I uh, just thank you for who you are. Jesus, I invite you here right now. Lord, use my mind, will, and emotions. Lord, use the prophetic gifting. I ask you to manifest the prophetic gifting on my life, Lord. Use the healing gifting, the deliverance gifting, uh, warfare, just whatever tool you need in my backpack, Lord. Use me to the fullest right now and speak to your people, Lord. Encourage them. Let this be a, confirm, a, com, a confirming word to many, many people about where they've come from and to where you're taking them, Lord. And let us stand rightly in love, Lord. Let us always stand rightly before you, Father. Not ever abuse uh, any power or authority that you give us. Let us honestly represent love for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, it's funny. I have been... <clears throat> Suffering with allergies. <laughs> That's not what I was going to say. Um, but I have been suffering with allergies really bad. I always do on here, it seems like, too. But um, it, it, it's funny, though. I was going to say that the last two weeks have been really interesting for me because God always talks to me like in bits and pieces. And then he puts the whole puzzle together like at the like after a period of time, usually after a week or after two weeks, whenever he's ready for me to release a word. So it's apparent right now in my walk that he's not releasing words as often as he was. And I think that's to give me kind of time to work on a lot of different projects that I'm working on. Um, but what he's been talking to me about, the topic is about people trying to take what's not theirs. And he's been talking to me strongly about that the last two weeks. And especially yesterday, he had me release a prophetic warning uh, that God is going to start dealing with those who continually take things that out there is, or that try to take things. He's not even going to allow them to take anything else from his people that are truly meant to stand up in these places of position right now, in these places of leadership especially. But there have been people inside the church and outside the church that have been coming at God's remnant. And they're coming at people because of jealousy or insecurity or envy um, and saying uh, word cursings against these people. They've been used by the devil for years to speak evil decrees or word curses and they're prophetic vessels. So a prophetic word goes out and it alights, whether it's a cursing or not. But, and unless we know that it's operating or we can, we can pick up on it if the Holy Spirit reveals it to us, if we're attentive, do we, or are we able to break it off? And the problem is if we're not, if we don't sense it, if we don't pick up on it, those words that are sent out uh, are planted in our gardens. They're called mixed or bad seed. They're called bad seed. And it creates mixed soil in our outer courts and in our inner courts and hinder us from moving into the Holy of Holies, which a.k.a. is destiny. So for many of you who have been struggling the last, I would say, 30 years, I've really noticed it. I didn't notice it at first in my own life, but... I would pick up on it. The Holy Spirit would show me who was speaking word cursings over me. And I would think, why? Why? I mean, and I, and I understand better now because I'm a truth prophetess. And so I weld a double-sided sort of truth. There are some prophets that weld uh, double mercy. There, are Most Christians, most prophets weld mercy and truth, one on each side of their sword. But there are some prophets that weld double mercy and some of us that weld double truth. And the double truth prophets are the ones that are sent into very, very dark places and we're commanded by God and given revelatory words, revelatory prophetic words um, to set the captives free, like Moses did to Pharaoh and saying, hey, let my people go kind of a thing, whether it be in the workplace, whether it be in a church place or um, God writes Ichabod on the doors and the glory departs. 
<clears throat> but and that's happened to me several times. But it's also forced me into a position of wearing a black hat, as I'm sure it's have done, has done many of you, uh, to where you, it's put us in some pretty peculiar positions um, to where we have to obey God, whether we like it or not. And it's hard. It's really, really hard. But we're in a season now where God is now addressing those people who kept coming at us, who we had to address years ago, or even maybe some people we haven't addressed yet, but people that are still trying to come at us, come at us and take things that are not theirs. They're going to try, <clears throat> but they're not even going to get off the starting line uh, because God's going to decree judgment on them. And the Lord told me in this season, if they continue to try to behave that way, what God will do is he's going to use an Esther 9, one type of a thing to where the thing that they meant for harm for God's remnant will boomerang back onto their life and cause double the losses. And so it's pretty significant. And, and I'm just like, wow, this is pretty scary. And I even wondered if I heard him right or not until today when he got into it in his own word, when he was talking about Ananias and Sapphira, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me stay on track and uh, we'll get there. So God was talking to me about true leadership and how people try to take things that are not theirs. And he used Solomon as an example. When Solomon's brother, uh, Adana, Adan, Adonjai, Adonjai, I think that's how you say his name, um, had manipulated Bathsheba um, into allowing um, him to uh, marry this certain, uh, this certain woman. And I want to say she was one of the king's concubines, I think. And... Bathsheba complied and went to Solomon, and Solomon allowed it. And but it was still for the purpose of undermining the king, undermining the anointing. And um, but that's what's going on. It was Abishag is who he asked in marriage. Actually, as a concubine, Abishag. So basically, he was basically trying to undermine and take something again that wasn't his. And the king got really infuriated. King Solomon got really infuriated. And he said, you might as well ask me to give him the kingdom. He goes, you know that he's my older brother and that he was, he has Abathar the priest and Joab of Zura, Zuriah on his side, son of Zuriah on his side. So basically these, some of these people um, are in the body of Christ. <laughs> body of Christ and they've been running with the crowd for such a long time in their need for identity it's amazing to me what power how power can corrupt people when um, or especially people that lack identity when they have if they're seeking identity if they entered into that position lacking identity from the very beginning but like they didn't have an identity in Christ so they didn't have a firm foundation so they seek their identity out through people, being accepted by people, running with certain types of people, say uh, people that have money or say people that or they, they since have power in the church. And they, they sashay up alongside these people and do whatever it takes to be accepted by these people, even turning against their own families like this guy did to his own brother. So pardon me, um, <clears throat> but it's anything to be accepted anything to be accepted because of their lack of identity. And so this is a season now. And, and God is funny because God just showed me a um, scripture yesterday about that, about when people run with the crowds and don't stand up for righteousness, but instead pervert justice, God holds them accountable. And so he's, God's lowering the hammer in this season. He's really lowering the hammer. He's not allowing us to get away with as much as we got away with in last season. And so, um, but God really, really, before I get too far into this, God really, really wants us to know for people that have been kind of in fear of that, because I've really struggled with it too and thinking, well, can they set me back again? You know, is it, is it always going to be like this two steps forward and five steps back kind of a thing? Well, it's like, no, it's, it's not going to be. Um, because once I establish a thing, nothing can take it away. And that's something that God wants us to come into a better understanding. So when God establishes a thing in our life, um, he keeps it. God's able to keep that which we've entrusted to him until that day. 
And if he establishes a certain thing, that means that nobody, nobody better touch it because it's built on the rock. Okay, a house built on the rock is established. It's got a firm foundation. And the Lord reminded me of that. He was asking me just this last week about how, how many things he'd given me in my life that I can really remember that that was of God. Pardon me. And I started remembering back and I started remembering very particular events, very particular relationships, very particular things that he'd given me, very particular positions that I knew he'd placed me. And nothing, nothing removed me. It didn't matter what warfare came against me. It didn't matter at all. God firmly held it in position until he was ready for me to move. And I really, really believe that in this season, God is also transitioning his remnant into a place where he is moving us into that mindset of understanding what when God establishes a thing it's firmly fixed nothing can touch us we can rest we can actually rest in him and know that he's got us he's got it he's able to keep a thing which we've entrusted to him until that day and by the way that's a scripture you need to write down God is able to keep that which we've entrusted to him <clears throat> until that day you have to look that up I don't know where it's at but our no the particular scripture but um it's a key in the spirit. God can keep your health. He can keep, uh, I, I prayed it over my teeth before, as dumb as that sounds when I've had a toothache, when I didn't want to have to have dental surgery and stuff. Um, I prayed it over uh, people. I prayed it over jobs. I prayed it over finances. It's a key. I'm showing you shortcuts in the spirit. He's able to keep that, which you've entrusted to him until that day. Say you have a certain amount of money allotted for something else, and the enemy keeps attacking you in your finances. Pray that scripture over it and he'll keep it. He'll keep it firmly in place. But these are these are keys to moving forward up your mountain and getting uh, established um, and maintaining our positioning while we're still climbing. So um, the Lord didn't take me to talking about an Ananias and Sapphira. And um, that's that was a pretty scary thing. It's about people challenging the place of power in God where the church is now moving and in and, and the remnant there's a certain group of this the remnant some are at the very head of it where they're moving in such power of the Lord um I hope I'm one of them I don't know <laughs> I try to just to maintain my my right relationship with the Lord but there's a place of power that God is moving the remnant now where people he's 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 vindicating us quickly he's vindicating us quicker we're not having to wait for years um, for God to stand up for what was right and what should have been right all around us all the time and so that's a serious serious place because if you knew anything about Ananias and Sapphira they dropped dead before the Lord because they didn't do what was right and so God is saying that um, I will, he, he then took me into talking about the apostles and he was confirming his word, basically talking about the apostles, how they went out and they preached the word after Jesus was crucified. Remember they scattered at first, they were all scared and they were upset, just beside themselves. And, and they thought, you know what, we need to be about our father's business. We need to go back out and start preaching the word. That's what we were sent in the earth to do. And so, um, they went back out and they were caught and arrested outside of the temple and, and jailed. But then they were released from jail and told never to do it again. Well, what did they do? They went right back out. I think it was Peter. I forget who it was that did this. I want to say it was Peter. It's one of them I heard. Um, but they went right back out and they started preaching the word of God again in the same place. And the guards went back after him again. And, and the Pharisees were really upset. They were like, you know, I can't believe these people are doing this again. And they arrested them, but they were afraid to do any harm to them because they were afraid they'd be mobbed by the people and attacked. The guards would be attacked and killed. So they brought them before the Pharisees, the Pharisaical Council. And there was one of the top Pharisees who was the most religious of them all. And he sent the apostles out of the room and he told his peers, he said, you know what? This has been my experience in the past in dealing with with these apostles because if it's really of God God's gonna sustain them you can't beat them you can't 
try to kill him. They'll just go on. He'll he'll protect them. He goes, but if it's not of God, God will, his hand won't be upon him for protection. And those are the ones that you've seen in the past where they've been killed and the people that were following them were scattered, et cetera, et cetera. So again, God was reaffirming what he'd been telling me about all week long about being able to keep that which we've entrusted to him until that day. And he wants us to know that. I mean, he really does keep it. And so I've had two weeks of dreams about this. I have had two weeks of quiet time confirmation regarding this. So you think God's trying to give me a message? I was like, I, it took me a while, but I was like, holy smokes, you really are trying to, to tell me something. And what was really, really interesting is that the other night I was watching the show and I still hadn't put all the pieces of it together. It's called The White Princess. And I was so disgusted. But she, her, it was the House of York and the House of Tudor. I don't know how many of you are familiar with history. I'm a big history buff, and so I love history. But the House of York lost the throne because they were invaded by the House of Tudor. And King George got the throne. And then Elizabeth, the daughter, the queen's daughter from the House of York, was forced to marry King George, and she hated him at first. She absolutely despised the guy, and he knew it. But eventually, they fell in love. She started to love him, and so she became loyal to the House of Tudor. But the problem was, was that the crown had been taken unjustifiably, and it had been stolen from that one family, from the House of York. And there were two princes. Have you ever heard of history about the two princes that were murdered in the Tower of London? My mom and I traveled to Europe in '98. And I remember walking through the Tower of London and hearing that story about one of the princes dying up there. And the other one managed to escape. <coughs> Pardon me. The queen mother from the House of York helped her son or her son Richard to escape and told him to run to the countryside and run to a group of people where he stayed for years, probably about five or six years until he matured enough to go back. And then he went over to his aunt's. <coughs> Pardon me. I want to say she was from Spain. But um, he went to, and she was a queen as well, and he went to her house, and his grandmother was also residing there at that time because she is, had initially been arrested with the House of York when the Tudors took them over. But the queen grandmother from the York side went to Spain and uh, sided with her cousin. That was her cousin. And so, or her niece, I think it was her niece, actually. Her niece was the queen. So Richard's over there. He spends a few months over with his aunt and grandmother and decides to take back the throne. So he initially he goes back. The, the tutors find out about it, and they want to know if he's real or if he's an imposter. So they try to make him out like he's an imposter. They're trying to come at him and lie about him to the, to the people because the people, the townspeople, are still very, very loyal to the House of York because they knew it had been stolen. The crown had been stolen unjustifiably. And so people know. I mean, that's part, I'm not going to get in and take up all this time telling you about that, but people know when something is wrongfully done to others. They know. They've observed. They know the difference. If they're walking with God, they know the difference between right and wrong. And they may not voice it, but they know. And so long story short, I was watching this show and I got really disgusted. A very righteous anger came up on me because Lizzie, or they called her Lizzie Elizabeth, the queen's daughter who married George, was so power hungry and so desperate to maintain her power that she killed her own brother in order to do that. And he made her look at him. He goes, you look at me because they were getting ready to cut his head off with the sword. They only did it. They did world's beheadings with swords, not with that long blade thing that they did for everybody else. He goes, you look at me. You look me in the eye because I want you to know what you're doing is very ungodly. It's against God. And what she didn't realize in that moment is that when she came against the, the anointing on Richard's life by taking his life, she called a curse down from God upon her own bloodline. Those are the blessings and the cursings based on Deuteronomy 27 and 28. If you do this, you get this. God says, touch not mine anointed. Bring my prophets and my prophetess is no harm. He means what he says, folks. God means what he says. And we're in those times. We're really entering into So I started, uh, God took me from there from watching about the House of York and the House of Tudor um, to talking about how people in past seasons 
are now that have wronged you, wrong, that have wronged you. Um, pardon me. Um, they're getting afraid because if you've been feeling a sense of pressure around you, like people starting to manifest, people that have held you down for years under their thumb, they try to control and manipulate you through circumstances, through uh, catch twenty two circumstances that they create yet they belittle you for the positions that they put you in kind of a thing god's like no no more i'm raising them up anyway you can't touch them you can't hold them back pharisees he, and so god's raising us up anyway he's moving us into position and and part of that manifestation that we're sensing on these people is the fact that they realize they're losing power and that's jezebel jezebel's losing power a lot of people are waking up from underneath Jezebel in this season. That's what we need to be praying for them as well. They're waking up to the truth. And as they're waking up, they're realizing all the lies they've been living in. And, and I don't know about you, but the worst, most horrible payback that God can give anybody would be in making them live with lifelong regret over horrible behavior patterns and the ways that they've treated other people when they realize how grossly wrong how grossly uh, their conduct, the, the conduct that they participated in against these people or against you and I, um, has been when their eyes are finally open to the truth. I mean, that's there's a lot of regret. Regret's a hard, hard thing to live with. And it's, it's a constant reminder. But, you know, I think that serves its purpose in the respect that, to me, if that's what it takes to make them not ever behave that way again, then God has achieved what he wanted to achieve because their hearts have been forever changed in knowing the correct way in which they're to walk. And so people that have wronged us in past seasons now are afraid, but they're growing more afraid because they see the power of God raising on our vessels and they see where God's taking some of us. But they're afraid that once we become seated, they're afraid that we're going to use our authority against them authority of Christ in us. But you know that's not godly, right? You know that that's not love. And I'm have to say, where's the love in that? Because I'm not God. You're not God. So we need to allow God to deal with these people's hearts. They're going to have enough on their plate to deal with, with all the regret they're fixing to have to walk through. Because when you get your eyes open to a thing, after you've been doing it for so stinking long, trust me, that's pretty hard. Pretty hard to live with. It's pretty difficult. So... Finally, the Lord's taken me to Psalms 125, 1 through 5, where he's talking about those who trust in the Lord are secure as Mount Zion. We can rest in him. We've been trusting him for years. They're not going to be defeated, but will endure forever. Those of us that are secure in the Lord. And just as the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surround his people, surrounds his people both now and forever. The wicked will not rule the land of the godly. For then the godly might be tempted to do wrong. O oh Lord, do good to those who are good, whose hearts are in tune with you. But banish those who turn to crooked ways, O oh Lord. Take them away from those who do evil. May Israel have peace. So, you know, there seems a way that's right to a man. But the end is death. So when people, when these people have started off, when these people had started mistreating us a long time ago, years ago, I mean, I guess what the Lord was telling me is that he told me this this last week. He said, you know, Missy, we're all moving from faith to faith and glory to glory, which means we're all evolving. And I've, I've even had, I mean, different leaders come against me because I'm a pretty brash leader in the respect because I'm just very, it's the way God built me. I'm truth oriented. I say what I mean. I mean, when I say in the respect of speaking only what the Lord tells me to say to people, <clears throat> and a lot of the times I won't say anything. Mm. Um, but I won't, I'm just very, very quiet and observant these days. And it's because I think that people know when they're doing wrong to other people. I think that people aren't stupid. And if they think that I'm stupid enough to buy into their garbage and that I'm just going to go along with them, I usually have a three strikes rule with those types of people. And then I'm going to, I'm going to give them an opportunity to change and course correct because I can already feel the red flag of God raising on my own vessel to correct them. But I don't even, I don't cross that finish line until God says go. Or, you know, but 
it, it, I give them three strikes. I give them three opportunities. And and they're even becoming shorter now. God is course correcting us that fast to keep us in line along with his spirit that he's course correcting us left and right now. He's But what he told me was that when I had all these leaders come against me, I have had people question the way that I talk sometimes. And sometimes I'll, I'll say a cuss word here and there and I'll repent. But I'm just very honest. I'm very real. I'm very raw with people because I feel like that's the new society that we're living in. In the Christian, in the body. He's making us get so real. Because if you think back 40, 50 years ago, say World War II, that era, the majority of, Christ, the majority of people in America were Christians. So there were very few people that were not Christian. Okay? It was a very... Uh, Weird thing not to be a Christian back then. But because the majority were Christians, people could just be themselves, flaws and all. They were loved for who they were, flaws and all. And and people were just changing. They knew that they moved from faith to faith and glory to glory, although they didn't probably call it that. They call it seasons, so to speak. You've just moved through different seasons of your life from uh, adolescence, young, being a little kid to adolescence to young adulthood. 30s, 40s, 50s, so on and so forth. But there were different seasons that you lived through, and you watch people transform and change. And I mean, we just knew that love walked through, walk, walk, excuse me, love walked with people. I can't talk today, but love walks with people through hard things and different changes in their lives, and that's what true love looks like. And you don't judge those people. You just think, well, they're having a bad day, they're having a bad season, they've hit a bad patch. And you just keep walking with them. You just keep walking. Sometimes God will pull you away to give them room to breathe. But for the most part, they're just walking with God. And so that's the place God wants us to be. He's trying to get us back to that real place, to that genuineness, to that authentic place, not to this plastic place that the church tried to create in the last 20 years or 30 years, of this Barbie place where, you know, if you look like me, Act like me, then I'll consider you godly. It's like, I'm going to be me. <laughs> I don't know about you. This is all I know to be. So um, I haven't changed, except for where God's changed me. But that's where he's calling us to be. He wants us to be authentically us. And he wants us to be uh, in the place where we know in our hearts and minds that we're loved. Just like we are, flaws and all. And he wants us to love each other like that. And I don't think there's a doggone thing wrong with it. Matter of fact... It's a breath of fresh air to my ears. So I continue being me. I continue saying what he wants me to say. And sometimes I just he just lets me say that and then I repent and do 50 Hail Marys and we can continue to march, you know. But he's not going to force us to be something that we're not anymore. And I think that's part of this new season we're entering into right now where we're bringing I mean, transformational revelation to the body, healing the body out of fragmentation, out of these old dysfunctional debunked mindsets that the church is instilled, that the world is instilled, and bringing people back into their right minds. Are you encouraged today? I hope you are, Lord. I mean, people, um, if you haven't gotten a copy of my book, my book is Memoirs of an ADHD Mind. It's about fragmentation, my journey out of fragmentation. My second book will be out. Um, probably in early next year when I get my credentials and so I can put doctor on them. But um, I, God is making me a professional, uh, an expert at dealing with fragmentation and dealing with bringing people back into their minds. We're changing the world one mind at a time. That's why I call my site Tame Your Braino. It's my goal in actually trying to educate you in the way of thinking and being really authentic and being real and raw when I minister on these different podcasts to you. So catch that at barnesandnoble.com and amazon.com. You can get it at missyhood.com, all three. If you get it at missyhood.com, I'll sign a copy for you. But um, make sure that you're doing something to get free. If God's challenging you with something that's setting you back from destiny, then it's time to start dealing with it. Know that I love you and that I'm praying for you. And I'll catch you here in a couple of weeks. Bye-bye.